six ways to use up a zucchini glut. Two different ways that you might include them in meals that you might not have thought about. Another way of preserving them through dehydration. Three other ways of preserving them. Hi guys, Carl here from Self Sufficient Hub and today we're gonna to be talking about dealing with courgette gluts. Now, if you're growing your own produce, you're almost certainly growing courgettes or zucchinis. And one of the reasons that you're almost certainly growing them is because they are such a giving plant. You can have a really, really productive courgette plant deliver you a fresh, harvestable courgette almost every single day. So if you've got, like we do, several plants, we've actually got six, that some of which are still coming up to full production, but some of them are already there, we're gonna be getting probably between four and seven ripe courgettes every single day of this year through the harvesting season. So, how are you gonna deal with them? Well, there's several ways you can do it. So, one of the ways that we use a lot of our courgettes is actually to sell them at the side of the road. We've got a little egg shop, and when we are creating a lot of excess produce, then we sell them at the side of the road. And that is a great way of producing a small amount of income, but also of not letting your food go to waste. Now, that's easily gonna cover the cost of quite a lot of packets of seeds over the course of the year, if that's your inclination. There are lots of other things you can do, though, to preserve them for your own use, and some ways that you can use them up that perhaps you hadn't thought about. Now the first thing I want to talk to you about is using them in meals. So what we're gonna do is at some point later today, I'm going to make a moussaka. Now a moussaka is a Mediterranean dish and it's full of beautiful flavors, really strong flavors. And traditionally it uses the aubergine or eggplant. It's constructed in a similar way to a lasagna, but with very different flavors. And if you imagine a lasagna, but instead of using those sheets of pasta, you actually will usually use aubergines or eggplants. Well, I'm gonna substitute that for my courgettes or zucchinis. And the flavor difference is very, very marginal, but because there's so much flavor in the actual sauce, the meaty part of the dish, you're not really gonna notice the difference. So that's one thing I'm going to do, which is gonna use up a decent amount. One of the reasons that I'm choosing a moussaka as the dish I'm gonna make is it's gonna allow me to make a really big pot of that really beautiful, flavorful, meaty sauce. Because then what I'm gonna be able to do is make a moussaka with some of that and then save the rest. And the rest of that sauce we're gonna to use to make courgette boats. Now what we do to make a courgette boat is we just cut the courgette straight down the middle scoop out some of the inside so it hollows it out like a boat, and then we fill that with our topping. We also do that with a bolognese sauce quite a lot, and it's one of our family favorites at this time of year. So those are a couple of ways that you can use up courgette plants in your cooking that you might not have thought about, but there's also lots of ways we can preserve them. So the first thing we're going to do today is we're going to freeze some. But then after that, we're also going to make a chutney. Now, a courgette chutney is one of the simplest things in the world to make, and it's also delicious. Now, we eat quite a lot of chutney, I certainly do, because it goes so well with goat's cheese. So I love just goat's cheese, chutney, a little bit of salad on a slice of bread or a cracker, and uh, that, to me, is a beautiful lunch. It really is delicious. So we're definitely gonna make some chutney. We actually ran out of our courgette chutney about a month ago from last year, so I'm really desperate to get some more made, so we're gonna be doing that as well. But let's start with the freezing. So it couldn't really be much simpler to freeze courgettes. Chopping board, knife, that's it. There's lots of things to consider though, because what we're gonna do is we're literally going to just slice them up and then freeze them. But there are some other things you can do and you might want to do, depending on what you wanna use them for. So, because, we're gonna use quite a lot of them in sauces, like pasta sauces and things like that, and stews, then I know that I've got no issue at all with literally just chopping them up into about just under a centimeter and freezing them in bags, in portion-sized bags. 
And when I say a portion, I don't mean a portion that someone's going to eat. I mean a portion for meal making, which is quite a lot. I tend to make enough food for more than one family dinner at a time. So I'm literally, with the bulk of my freezing, I'm just going to slice them like this and then put them in a bag and put them in a freezer. Now, one thing to remember when you're freezing things, there's a lot of talk of blanching. And for some produce, that's vital. And for other produce, it's not so much. Now for courgettes, it's not so much, particularly if you're gonna use them in stews, casseroles, and sauces. So I'm literally just gonna pop these in a bag and freeze them. Part of the reason it's not so important when you're using them in a sauce is because that thick, crunchy texture that you get with a courgette isn't as important. If you're gonna serve them as a side dish, you're gonna want them to retain quite a lot of their structure. Whereas if we're going to put them in a bolognese or something like that, it doesn't really matter if they sort of go a little bit mushy. It doesn't affect the dish. What happens when you freeze something is it changes the makeup inside the cells of the thing you're freezing because the water molecules are going to freeze and they're going to actually burst the cell walls, which is what makes a lot of things go soggy. So if we were to cut a slice of this, now it would be quite firm. And if we were then to freeze it and then I was to bring it out the freezer and show you it again, it would be quite soggy when I did that with it. It would be quite wibbly wobbly. And that's not what you really want if your goal with these is to fry them up and serve them on their own next to something else on a dish. But that wibbly wobbly nature isn't actually a big deal for me in the way I'm gonna be using them. But if it is for you, then what you want to do is blanch them first which is basically, it's almost as simple. A lot of people are put off because it's so much work, but it really isn't. Just get a big pan of boiling water, pop them in there for a couple of minutes, take them out, let them dry, then freeze them. So the only difference really is a tiny bit of boiling water. It's hardly any washing up because you're not dirtying the pan. And that way, what's gonna happen is those cell walls are gonna be able to alter themselves through the cooking process in a completely different way than if they're frozen. And it means that when you freeze them and then later defrost them, they're gonna be much better at holding their structure. That goes for a lot of things we freeze, but there are a lot of things that we're told we have to blanch, we absolutely have to blanch. And you'll find resources online that'll tell you you have to blanch courgettes. You just don't. It does help to have a little bit of base knowledge as to why you're doing what you're doing and that's gonna help you make the decision as to whether or not you need to do it. So, I'm gonna carry on and slice up some of these and get them in the freezer, and then we're gonna start making our chutney, which is the next way we're going to preserve it. Before I move on, sorry, I just wanted to mention one thing. So, I'm gonna be freezing my guys in this bag like this. If you're going to be blanching them, it's really important to bear in mind that Despite your best efforts, if you put them in a bag like this, they're going to stick together. Not necessarily a problem, but definitely something to bear in mind. So what you might want to do is put them all on a tray first so that they can freeze individually, then put them in a bag. That's one option. I don't tend to do that a great deal because everything I'm looking to do is about reducing the amount of work involved. So I don't tend to do that. What I tend to do is just make sure that I'm freezing them in the right size batches because what that allows me to do is take them out and it doesn't matter if they're all stuck together because I can allow them to defrost and then put them into whatever it is I'm using them for. Another quick tip, and this is for all types of preserving with a plant like this, try and remove the blossom end, the end that had the flower because that's where your plant is going to start degrading from quickest. So it's just going to help to remove this if you're going to be doing anything like brining or pickling or anything like that. Just remove the blossom end, make sure that that part of the plant's gone because if you do have any degradation in the plant, that's where it's going to be at the start. Okay, next up we're gonna be making our chutney. And I lean very heavily on this amazing book. It's by Alice Fowler. And it's definitely one I recommend. It's something I find myself reaching for several times a year. 
And one of the reasons I like it is because I don't really like recipes too much. I don't use recipes and I certainly don't give recipes because I don't measure things. I don't measure anything ever whenever I cook. So um, everything I do is done on feel. So forgive me, I'm not gonna be able to give you an exact recipe, but what I like is the basic guidelines and fundamental knowledge so that you can adapt recipes and change them. So I'm gonna read directly from the book just for a second and in this book it says, as a general rule of thumb, for every kilogram of fruit or vegetables, you're gonna want five grams of salt, 100 grams of sugar, and 125 to 250 milliliters of vinegar. Well, that works for me. And that's basically how I use these sort of resources to build my own recipes for what I need. Now, there's loads of great information in this book, but the thing is with chutneys is, and this is all explained in this book and others, is that the types of vinegar and the types of sugar that you use do make a difference, but you can do anything you want. So if you use brown sugar, you're gonna get a darker chutney. If you use white sugar, you're gonna get a lighter chutney. Different vinegars are just gonna have different strengths in their flavor and give it slightly different flavors, but none of them are gonna ruin your chutney and give you a chutney you can't use. So it does come down to a combination of things. For me, it's largely based on what I've got in the cupboard, what I can produce myself. So we use apple cider vinegar for almost all our chutneys because that's something I can make myself. And in future, we might be using more and more honey when we've got our bees here up and running and producing honey for us rather than sugar at all. But for now, we use simple white cane sugar because it's the cheapest that I can buy and we do a lot of preserving here. So. Basically what we're gonna do is we're gonna chop these guys up. A quick word before we get started on that, the difference between a marrow and a courgette. Now that is definitely a courgette. A courgette is lovely and delicate, and a marrow is something twice the size of that is definitely a marrow. Now this guy is probably considered a marrow. I don't know what the actual definition dictates, but effectively a marrow is a big courgette. Now a marrow, when a courgette turns into a marrow, the skin becomes a bit tougher, the seeds become a bit bigger. So if you're using marrows, you're gonna to wanna to peel it and de-seed it. This guy, I'm not gonna know until I start chopping it up whether I need to do that with it. So let's start with this guy. And the easiest way is just a taste test. So I've got a bit of the peel here, a bit of the skin. And I'm very comfortable that this can all go in as it is, which is great news. So I've been weighing the courgettes and hopefully this is going to be about 680 grams, hopefully, because that will give me one and a half kilograms total. And that's a nice, easy round number for me to work with. And it leaves me just three of the smaller courgettes left over, 600. I'm okay with that. So we're gonna call that one and a half kilograms in there. So that's our courgettes, and that's gonna make up the vast majority of our chutney. So that's one and a half kilograms of courgettes. And like I said, I personally don't usually measure anything. I don't weigh anything. I would normally do this all just by eye and by feel, but for you guys, we're gonna you know, measure things out so that if you wanted to replicate it, you can but also to give you an idea of what I'm doing if you've not done something like this before. So roughly speaking, like we said before, for every kilogram, we're gonna want 100 grams of sugar and 200 ml of vinegar. So we'll quickly measure them out, and then we know that we've got that ready to go. So I'm gonna be using my homemade apple cider vinegar. It's important if you're gonna use your own homemade vinegar that you know it's at least 5% acidity because we're using that acidity for its preservation properties. So we're gonna put 300 ml in here, which is for our kilogram and a half. And then we're gonna add 150 grams of sugar. So it doesn't look like a great deal, does it, to go in that big pot, but that's plenty, that's all you need. Then we're just gonna add our bits and bobs, all the other stuff you want in it. Now I personally, I love spicy food, so we're gonna put some chilies in here. And we're also 
A lot of recipes call for um, currants or raisins or some kind of dried fruit. So it doesn't matter if you add dried fruit or not, but we've got some dried plums from our own tree and we're going to chop some of these up nice and fine and we're going to add that in there just for that extra depth of flavour and that sort of contrasting flavour to go with the courgettes. And when it comes to an amount, you know, it's up to you. It's completely up to you. That's the beauty of making chutneys is that there's no rules. There's lots of guidelines, but there's really no rules. So you can be as creative as you wish. And it's going to be very, very difficult for you to get it wrong. There we go. There's our dried plums. They're going to go in as well. Now I'm going to add some garlic. This is garlic from the garden. This is actually last year's garlic and we've stored it by fermenting it in honey. So there's only two ingredients in there, garlic and honey, and we're gonna take a couple of cloves out and basically chop them up nice and fine and add them in. So that's our honey fermented garlic going in. And then the last ingredient we're gonna add is some jalapenos. Now, don't know if you can see them very clearly because the brine is quite cloudy, but these are jalapenos that we've grown ourselves. And these again are last year's jalapenos that we preserved in brine. And we're just gonna chop these, I'm gonna use this whole jar because I like spicy food. So we're gonna chop this whole jar up and add that. I just love jalapenos. Absolutely love jalapenos. I would have jalapenos with almost everything. And whenever I eat out and there's jalapenos, there's never enough. So there we go. That's gonna be our, that's gonna be our spice element. And that's it. We're now good to go. The only thing I haven't added yet is the salt and pepper. So we're going to add a decent amount of salt and some black pepper. And then we're going to add our pot over there, which has got our vinegar and sugar in. And then we're basically just going to bring it to the boil and start stirring it. I'm already excited. <laughs> In fact, I'm already excited and frustrated because, uh, as I said before, although we've got other, we do have other chutneys in the house. We ran out of the courgette chutney, which I do particularly like. And uh, really, even when this is made, we're going to want to wait maybe four weeks. I won't be able to wait four weeks, but in an ideal world, we would wait four weeks for the flavours to kind of just settle in the jar it's a difficult thing to describe but when they're first bottled they're going to taste quite coarse quite uh it's really difficult to describe but quite unrefined whereas over time the flavors will just sort of settle down and really develop this lovely bold but calm flavor um, whereas they're going to be quite loud and spiky at the start and if you've made chutneys, you'll know kind of what I'm talking about. It's a really difficult thing to try and describe. We don't have the words in our language to uh, describe what I mean. But anyway, so we're gonna bring this to the boil now and then we're gonna stir it quite frequently because we definitely don't want it to stick. But it's gonna take a little while. It's gonna take anything between half an hour and an hour. So we're gonna let this come to a boil and I'm going to start processing the jars ready to bottle it. Now, one thing you'll find when you're making chutneys out of courgettes versus a lot of the other things that you might use is they've actually got a fair amount of moisture in them that they're going to diffuse while they're cooking. Now, there are two things you can do. And the first thing, and it's as suggested in the book I showed you earlier, is actually to basically dust them in some salt before you cook them, leave them so the salt draws out some of the water and then you rinse them and pat them down. Well, as you know, I'm not looking to do anything that's gonna be more work. So what I do instead is I just make sure that for the first part of this process, I actually have them boiling on a higher heat than I would otherwise. And you'll see very soon that we're gonna have quite a lot of steam coming off. And that's how I'm gonna reduce the moisture content in this and hopefully that's gonna basically do the same job as taking the water out of the courgettes before you started because the steam that's coming off is gonna be water. It's gonna be water reducing out of that mixture. It's not gonna be taking away the vinegar, the sugar or any of the other things that we wanna keep. 
Okay, so that's been boiling quite hard, a really fast rolling boil for around 10 to 15 minutes. You can see all this steam coming off. So what I'm now gonna do is I'm just gonna reduce the heat slightly. Still gonna be a fairly high heat, but not the maximum. And we're just gonna simmer it now. And I'm expecting that process to take around half an hour. In the meantime, what I've been doing is I've cleaned all these jars. They're all as clean as I can get them. And I've turned the oven on to 120 degrees centigrade. So 120 degrees is going to sterilize these jars. So about 10 minutes before the chutney's ready, I'm gonna put this tray of jars into the oven and that's gonna sterilize them. And then while I finish the chutney up, they'll be in the oven, then I'll pull them out and then we'll be ready to go. Nothing that I use that is a specialist piece of equipment is necessary. So whatever you're doing, you don't need specialist equipment but it can be nice. This here is a wide mouth funnel, so that's gonna sit on top of our jars. And for processing this really, really hot food, having this makes a huge difference. The other thing I've got are these tools, which are just for handling really hot jars. When your jars and lids are super hot, and you're gonna want them to be super hot, you're gonna want them to be sterile, we're gonna find it so much easier to handle them with these than any other method. And this is also really useful. It's just a little magnet, and it's really useful for picking up the hot lids and putting them on. Such hard work. Okay, it's been simmering for about 25 minutes. Now all I'm doing is just, I'm just stirring it regularly to ensure it doesn't stick. While this is happening, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna start preparing the last way that we're gonna preserve our courgettes. So I've got these two guys left and we're gonna preserve these by brining them. Now we're just gonna use a really simple salt water solution. And we're gonna basically do exactly the same as I'm gonna do in a second, not for this video, with a load of cucumbers. We're gonna do a load of dill pickled cucumbers with a salt brine. And I'm gonna use the same salt brine to preserve the last of these courgettes. So what I've got in here is 500 ml of dechlorinated water. So when you get tap water, it's got chlorine in it. Now in the UK, we have considerably less chlorine in our water than in the US. So the jury is out as far as I can tell as to whether or not the dechlorination is vital in the UK, but it does make a difference because basically the chlorine in the water is going to inhibit all the good stuff, all the good bacteria that we need for our preservation through brining. Now, I'm using tap water that I've basically let sit for 24 hours. That's enough to dechlorinate it. I think, I am fairly confident that you could just use straight tap water in the UK and while it might take a day or two longer, you're actually gonna be okay but you're gonna to have to do your own research on that because I've done a fair amount and the results are inconclusive. So I've got 500 ml of water here and I'm just gonna add two teaspoons of salt to it. That's it. Okay. Okay, so I've added my sea salt to the water, just two teaspoons. I'm gonna give it a good stir now to make sure that it's all dissolved. And the next thing I'm going to do is to slice our courgettes ready for brining. So we're almost ready to jar it up now. Just for my own curiosity, I'm gonna have a little taste. Mmm. Oh, it's so good. Oh, it's so good. It's got um, that kick, that lovely kick. The, the actual flavors are still quite uh, sour and sharp and punchy. Um, so it's not perfect, but it will be when it settles down, when it sort of all evens out and all those little flavors that kind of kick you in the face when you're eating it. Now, they'll all settle down and spread out around the chutney and it would just be, oh, I'm yeah, really happy. Well, to say I'm really happy is an understatement. This is gonna be delicious. And as an accompaniment to my goat's cheese, perfect. Right, so let's get those jars out the oven and uh, start jarring it up, which is where those tools come in. Now, it's always worth preparing more jars than you're going to need because things can happen, you know, things can go wrong and you're going to want a spare jar or two.
I'm just going to use a spoon to push it all down and try and make sure that we get as much air out of the jar as we can. Not out of the jar, but out of the mixture. There we go. And we want to leave about an inch of headroom at the top. So that's our first jar done. And you, you just do them, you know, just fairly tight. You don't have to do them super tight. And then what's gonna happen is as the mixture cools, it's gonna suck that lid down and then you know you've got a good seal. And both this method, the, uh, the chutneying and the brine fermenting are both going to retain that lovely crispiness of the courgette which for me is really important. So that's the chutney done. And finally, here we have the courgettes in the saltwater brine. So it really is as simple as it looks. So I've sliced the courgettes, as you can see, into long, thin slices, and we've basically stuffed them into the jar. Now, the last few, I did film me doing all this, or at least I thought I did, but for some reason, I must have uh, pressed the wrong button and I didn't actually record the footage. So I'm just gonna explain it to you now. The last few slices that I did, I actually cut into a wedge shape. And what that meant was when the courgettes are all in the jar, you can use those wedges to drive into the top and expand them and make it really, really tight so that they stay below the water. When you're brining, it's really vital that you keep all of your produce below the water because anything that breaks the surface of the water there is going to be a home for mold to form on and that's not something you're gonna want. Now, in a day or two, we're gonna start seeing gases form and that's a sign that our fermentation is taking place. And these guys will quite happily sit in here for weeks and weeks at room temperature. They will gradually get a little bit vinegary, a little bit sour, and it's up to you when you want to stop them souring just by tasting them, taste them every week or two. And when they're at a flavor you like, you can put them in the fridge and that's going to basically retard the fermentation process, which is what's gonna be causing that sour taste. Now, I personally like them sour, so I'm gonna leave them out of the fridge pretty much indefinitely. But uh, there you go, that is courgettes brined. The only other thing I wanted to say is there's another way of preserving a courgette or a zucchini, and that is with a dehydrator. Now you can dehydrate courgettes like you can so many other of our produce, and it's really simple. You just cut them into thin slices and then you use the dehydrator. You put them in your dehydrator for anything from six to 12 hours on 65 to 75 degrees, depending on how thick they are. Basically, the thicker they are, they want to be on a lower temperature for longer and very, very thin slices, higher temperature for less time. And they'll keep for a very long time if you keep them in mason jars or somewhere where they're gonna stay sealed and they're not going to rehydrate, basically. You could also use a very low oven for dehydrating. So I'm not gonna show you that today, only because it's not something we do a tremendous amount of. We don't, we prefer our courgettes preserved in these ways and in the freezer like I've shown you. So that's how we choose to preserve ours. So there you go, that's six ways to use up a zucchini glut. We've spoke about two different ways that you might include them in meals that you might not have thought about. And we've talked about another way of preserving them through dehydration. But we've also shown you three other ways of preserving them. That is freezing them and brining them and making them into a chutney. So if you found this video useful, there's several ways you can support it. And the easiest of which are to press that like button and subscribe to our channel. Subscribing is absolutely free and it makes sure that you never miss out on content like this. The other things you can do is come and find us elsewhere online, Self Sufficient Hub website. You can also come and find us on Facebook where we are the Self Sufficient Hub page and group. We'd love to see you there. We also have the Self Sufficient Hub podcast which drops three times a week on Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays. And we are talking about all things self-sufficiency from growing and producing your own food to having a self-sufficient kitchen. So come and check us out. We'd love to see you there. Cheers.